This is a Clutch Pick Sports Betting Podcast, episode two of our season preview edition. My name is Sheldon Alexander, coming to you live from our illustrious studios in downtown Toronto. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. But we are here to break <laughs> down the NFL. And as mentioned, this is part two, meaning if you, you, you found this one and you didn't yeah. listen to part one, it means you need to do part. some scrolling. Or I guess you could do it out of order because we split it up in terms of conferences. This is the NFC season preview of your NFL season. And of course, part one by, you know, just simple maths means that part one is the AFC. Does that add up? Does that connect? Anyways, as mentioned, my name is Sheldon Alexander. This is the Clutch Pick Sports Betting Podcast, and I'm joined, as always, by my guy, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Matt Russell, sports betting professional and creator of The Window, available on Substack and via the podcast. Mr. Matt Russell, how are you, my friend? Uh, I am just as excited as I was when we did part one, the AFC. So if you... If you're listening to this first and you're like, you know what? He doesn't sound that excited for having the boys back for another season. Pause this. Go listen to the first minute of the AFC one. Get the vibes of how excited I am. Then pause that and then come back to this to listen to the rest of this before going back. Or you could, you know what? Just read the or listen to the rest of this one and then do the AFC one. Like you said, out of order. You're not missing anything other than the fact that I'm probably going to mention, oh, like we said with the AFC, you know, a couple of different times, at which point, you know, you might not understand like what we said with the AFC until you listen to the AFC. Got it? Good. Yes. Options <laughs> of options of plenty for anyone that wants to listen to the NFL. We got you covered here each and every week. We'll be breaking down every single game in the NFL. I'll be trying to give you a pick to every single NFL game. And Matt tries to talk me in and out of my foolish bets each and every week. That's what we do here on the show. But as mentioned, this is a season preview. So for the NFC, let's get to it. As I scroll down or wait for the control room to switch gears to the oh, NFC control rooms at it again control room doing work the boys and you know what maybe it's because the control room knows and I'm a little rattled because we're going to start with the NFC West and oh boy I gotta be honest I've, I've talked to Matt heading into you know throughout the summer and heading into us doing this again and I've said and I mentioned to a bunch of friends, I am worried about my San Francisco 49ers. And I look at these odds here yeah. and I see the Niners are the favorites here to win said division. NFC West at minus 210. The Rams at plus 350. Seattle at plus 750. And Arizona at plus 1200. Now, much like we did for the AFC preview, we're not sitting here trying to tell you, hey, take the Niners at plus 210 because they're the overwhelming favorite. What we're trying to do is find you some value of where you can sprinkle a little something, something, and hopefully come up with the dub on the other end. I'm worried about the Niners. Everyone seems mm -hmm. to love the Seahawks. That's a long number, plus 750 here. But is this all about the new coach bump? Is that what's going on? Like everyone just like deuces Pete Carroll. Man, <laughs> nice yes. If it it is for me, because I'm right there with everybody else. Because I mean it, I mean, yeah, maybe it's just a little too obvious. And maybe we all just sort of like read the same stuff and listen to the same stuff and yada yada yada. But like put it this way, right? If you followed me for 10 minutes during an NFL season in the past on Twitter, you know on a Thursday night where the Seahawks are involved, a Monday, a Sunday night, whenever, I just I continually can't believe Pete Carroll is out here doing the things that he's doing, making the decisions that he's making. And I don't know that you can calculate. I mean, you literally can't calculate it, but I don't know how, like how many points is too many points to calculate the idea of removing Pete Carroll and putting in a head coach, first year head coach, admittedly, but a guy who has studied under John and Jim Harbaugh, right? Like these guys who know what they're doing with regards to like you know, scheme, obviously, but certainly strategizing, using timeouts, when to go for it on fourth down, all of that stuff, right? This stuff that just drove me crazy with regards to Pete Carroll he's not 80 uh, years towards old the end of his Pete intro. Carroll. No, and, and, and listen, I don't want to be an ageist or whatever, but like Pete was, had lost the plot with regards to like 
the modern day NFL, when to go for two, all of that kind of stuff, right? He's out there raw rawing and, and cheering everybody up and chomping on the gum and God love him for it, right? And he had a great career. But like by the end, it was like, dude, this is the modern day NFL where like we don't have to teach people, or at least hopefully we don't have to teach people. I'm sure it'll come up in like week two about like the team going for two when they're down eight, right? Like it's like people well, can't wrap their head around. To do that again. I, sorry, I guess sorry we, to, I, to, to remind you. I guess we are. And that's like, I guess, an advanced way of sort of saying that like Pete Carroll just didn't really understand what was going on. Right. And so Okay, so that's just game management in-game stuff, right? That's beyond the sort of idea that, like, Pete Carroll might not have ran the tightest ship with regards to, like, practices and off-season training and preseason stuff, et cetera, et cetera, right? So Mike McDonald, a defensive guy, right, coming in with a team that I think is pretty talented defensively. And so I look at it this way when it comes to any sort of team building, coaching changes, et cetera, et cetera, right? A coach is going to come in. He's either going to be, you know, sort of have a defensive background or an offensive background, unless he's Matt Patricia, in which he's telling you he has both and he doesn't actually have either. So he's you're either defensive or you're offensive. I he's want a, a guy cool coming pencil, in, though, right? He's got a cool. He pencil. does, yeah, and, a, and an aggressive beard. Thank God that guy's out of our lives. Uh, at least we hope. Maddie Peak. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maddie Peak. Uh, Okay, defensive coach. Okay, good. I want you do your thing with the defense. Is the other side of the ball talented? Can we get by on talent? And you know, listen, you might have an opinion about Geno Smith that is maybe not all that high. I think Geno Smith can run an offense if he's got talent around him. I think the Seahawks have some a couple of good running backs. I think they have talent galore to throw to. When a guy like Jake Bobo is like a third or a fourth or a fifth option, like I think that's pretty good. I think you're gonna get a big year out of DK Metcalf. I think you're gonna get a big you know, jumping, uh, you know, jump from year one to year two with Jackson Smith and Jigba. I think the offensive line, obviously, a lot of people have a lot of problems with it. I think it's going to be a little bit better than people think. And so I think on both sides, by the way, they hired Brian Grubb, who was the offensive coordinator just down the road at Washington, right? The guy who had, was on that Penix, this team that went to the national championship game. And they had a super, you know, a lot of super creative play calling. Obviously, they had a ton of talent. But I think it's a pretty similar offense that they're going to run here or that they can run here with Smith being the Michael Penix and, and DK being the Roma Dunze, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's a lot of ways that this can go really well for the Seahawks. And I honestly, I don't know what the like numerical mathematical difference is between Pete Carroll and a guy making good salient decisions. And maybe this guy, maybe Mike McDonald isn't that dude. And I think maybe, you know, hopefully we'll find that out earlier than later. But when it comes to pricing this division, when you've got the Rams sitting there in between the 49ers and the Seahawks, a Rams team that last year was pegged as like the third or fourth lowest win total going into that season and started the season three and six, three and seven, I think. And then obviously had a nice little burst there after the bye week. Matthew Stafford was able to stay healthy. You know, we talked about a certain older quarterback that I don't think is going to stay healthy in the AFC. Matt Matt Stafford's elbow just seems to be just kind of hanging there, right? Where at any moment it could go badly. And if it does, then I think the Rams are in big trouble. And I don't know that enough people are talking about the fact that Aaron Donald is no longer on the Rams. And therefore, racing dudes every, in parking lots. <laughs> every, every player gets worse yeah. when Aaron Donald is not on the field. And this is a team that is the Rams that has the least expensive defense in the entire league. So they're not paying for anything. They have two rookies from last year who played really well, again, alongside Aaron Donald. And then they drafted two more rookies for this year, both from Florida State to be on the defensive line. That's a pretty young defensive line that again, doesn't have Aaron Donald causing all kinds of scenes in the middle of that D line. And so the offense, okay, you got Cooper cup, not the fastest guy in the world. Puka Nakua, not the fastest guy in the world. All of a sudden, Kyron Williams became a problem for defenses last year, which was kind of like a weird turn of events. I don't know that like we saw that necessarily coming. And all of a sudden, if all of those things kind of went away or sort of took a step back, then I think the offense is, you know, in some in some trouble. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know that I don't think the Rams are the second best team in the NFC West. And I know as a 49ers fan, you're having flashbacks right now to that old 49ers Seahawks rivalry in the Legion of Boom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like it might be that this year. And, you know, obviously, you know, you know as well as anybody, and everybody knows it because we've been pummeled with it over the last like two months. Brandon Ayuk, is he going to be on the team? Is he not going to be on the team? Is he going to play week one, et cetera, et cetera? 
we see week one's line going down, 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 because both Ayuk and Trent Williams, you know, the closer we get, the less likely it is that they're going to play or the, you know, the more likely it is that they're not as effective as they've we have sort of gotten used to. And, you know, listen, Debo, uh, did you watch receiver? My guy is getting hurt on like, it's seemingly every second, you know, play. He was literally hurt in every single playoff game that they played in last year. And you can really like the 49ers and really like the way the 49ers play as far as like being one of the like five aggressive teams, physically aggressive teams in the most aggressive sport that there is. But like that adds up and they have a lot of mileage on their bodies since essentially that Super Bowl run back in 2020, I believe it was the first one, uh, 49ers and Chiefs, right? It's like they've been playing a lot of football games and they've been playing a lot in the hardest way possible. So you can see a lot of money's come in on under 11 and a half where that is, it's now pretty heavily juiced to that side. And if they only win 11 games or they only win 10 games this year, there's a possibility that Seattle with a easier schedule than the 49ers comes up and does that thing that we see all the time in the NFL, which is like the 49ers take a step back and the Seahawks take a step up with a change in culture, with a change in sort of attitude and a change of analytics. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility at, and then listen, at plus 750, that's a risk I'm willing to take because it's not that significant of a risk when it comes to like whether or not it wins, right? Like if it wins, it's a great thing. If it lost, if it loses, it's just one unit, you know, that's just a drop in the bucket. And also to like, from a Niner standpoint, I, I know it's preseason. And if, you know, the guys that you're hoping for in preseason do well, then you're like, yeah, this is a great sign. And if they do poorly, you're like, oh, well, it's just preseason. Yeah. Brock Purdy. Yeah. Because yeah, he's okay. a guy that from like last year that we talked about a lot on this yeah. pod that we were like, okay, like he's solid, but like all the boosts of, of what kind of contract he's going to get MVP talk, all of that was way too much. I'm going to be yeah. honest with you that I was paying attention a lot to Josh Dobbs. It is making me think like, could we see Josh Dobbs at <laughs> some point throughout this season and how, how is his, yeah. you know, scientists scientist mind gonna work with shanahan yeah. is that a thing the that astronaut. could work you know the astronaut part of me yeah. do you know what i mean like yeah. that's where my <laughs> head's at and i know i'm talking to myself in the circles here because i'm just <laughs> still rattled from the super bowl yeah. and an overtime loss of the chiefs again but yeah. i'm just saying if there is a year for the niners to uh fall back all the signs are there. Banged up McCaffrey. Brock Purdy is Brock Purdy. Do you know what I mean? You don't have I. You don't have Trent. Yeah. Debo's banged up. You know, Kittle's a year older. Their defense is still nice, but we'll see. We have a brand new defensive coordinator who, who knows if it's actually him yeah. or if it's going to be Shanahan calling the defense. <laughs> As right. we know, we had issues last year. There's just so many question marks. That I'm looking at minus 210, and I'm thinking, who's taking that? Because it ain't me. Yeah. So – you know, what does the end of somebody's, you know, a team's window look like, right? And it's often, it starts with you lose coordinators, you lose depth, depth pieces, both on the sidelines and on the field, right? So like the Eric Armsteads of the world, of the world end up on different teams. And like, yeah, it all kind of looks the same because Fred Warner is still there and Nick Bosa is still there. But like, what if those two guys you know, miss some time at various points this season, right? There isn't the same depth to either replace them in a literal way on the field or have somebody else step up. And you talked about Brock Purdy, right? Like, I think you and I think he's running the offense in a great way and he does that really well. I don't think he would be that great if he was on another team. Uh, obviously, situations matter in the NFL. Depends on the team. If he was on the Chiefs, maybe he would be, you know, really great. If he's on the Giants, like maybe he would be Daniel Jones, right? So like, we don't know that. And I would have killed to see more Sam Darnold last year in that 49ers offense. Like give me three games where it's just only Sam Darnold, just so that we could get a better idea of it, right? Because Jimmy G is like almost fallen out of the bottom of the league. And like that was the guy who was the starting quarterback for very good teams, teams that made the Super Bowl with the 49ers, right? And so like, the turnover worthy throw Throw rate for Brock Purdy is the thing that worries me, right? And even yeah. watching him in the limited time in the preseason, it's like, man, it's I get it's the preseason and you can get a little loose, but like he is really testing the idea that like George Kittle is just going to get that ball or, you know, Debo obviously is going to get that ball or Ayuk, if he comes back and is on the team, is going to get the ball. So like there's a lot of ways where, again, it doesn't have to turn into like five and 12. And by the way, you mentioned McCaffrey, right? 
and like a couple of decently healthy ish seasons from McCaffrey has everybody forgetting that at the end with the pat with the Panthers, you know, he could barely get on the field. He could barely stay on the field. Right. So how many more good years does he have left? Right. And again, when it comes to odds at minus two ten, when I can make a case for a burgeoning contender to be coming out of that division, I can't lay the minus 210. I, I'm more likely to lay the minus 250 with the Chiefs because I don't really like the other three teams in the AFC West than here where I can make a viable case for at least one of the teams, you know, if not more than that. We should probably mention the Cardinals who are sitting back there with like a capable Kyler Murray, capable of losing them a ton of games, capable of winning them a ton of games. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to expect from Arizona. Obviously with Kyler in there, they are a far more dangerous team. Of course, beating the Eagles last year in that second to last game in the regular season, a critical game for the 49ers. And like, by the way, even the 49ers last year, again, one year younger, everybody across the board, you know, they, I think, didn't they only win 11 games? I think they ended up under their win total, but they needed that. It was like 11 or 12 wins. So it's not like this is a team that was 15 and two, 14 and three last season. Yeah, and definitely looking at the Niners, it's it's going to be a, an interesting season, and, and we talked about it on the previous pod about the Monday Nighter. There's going to be a lot to learn from that first game on both sides, whether you're talking from the Jets' standpoint or from the Niners' standpoint. But interesting storylines aplenty for sure. And interesting storylines, as always, in the NFC East as well, as Philly leading the odds there at minus 135 to win the NFC East, Dallas at plus 170, Washington at plus 1,000, and the Giants at plus 1,200. Now, looking at this this division here, right, we talked about it a little bit or we teased it a little bit about what happened last season where Dallas – was not the favorite team. It was one of the value bets we gave you last year in terms of Dallas being able to come back and and win the NFC East last year. And we look and we're kind of at the same point here, but I feel like there's more drama surrounding Dallas and Philly this year than there was Mm -hmm. last year. And I don't really know which one is in the better spot, but I do know that Philly being such an overwhelming favorite at minus 135, I'm not sure if, how I feel about that, right? When most of the storylines yeah. in the offseason was about the quarterback and the coach not being on the same page last year. But what what do you make of this division? Yeah, so I'll put it this way. I, I'm with, there's been a lot of move towards Philadelphia. Uh, they, I don't believe they opened as the favorite. I think Dallas, obviously, having coming off, you know, winning the division. Um there have been a lot towards Philadelphia. And honestly, the more you look into Philadelphia and what happened last year and what the possibilities are this year, it's completely understandable because to me, Philadelphia's issues were last year. And to me, Dallas's issues are all the time. <laughs> right. And it's just like, it's never goes away with Dallas. Right. And obviously yeah. they got CD lamb back in there and that's great. And, and, and all that sort of thing. But Philadelphia last year, they had to replace two coordinators and that's the sort of luck of the draw with all of this. Right. We're going to talk about Detroit here in a second. Right. And somehow they ended up keeping their offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson from going somewhere else as a head coach. Philadelphia wasn't so lucky two off seasons ago where both offensive coordinator Shane Steichen and Jonathan defense coordinator, Jonathan Gannon got head coaching jobs. And we talked about, I believe it was in the last show, um, or maybe it was earlier in this show that they're all blended together. uh, Our guy, Matt Patricia, like that was deemed an option, the option for Philadelphia defensively last year. (laughs) Shockingly, it did not go well. (laughs) right and it's like that was your guy like you replaced jonathan gannon with matt patricia and like literally demoted another guy like midway through the season so that matt patricia could take over after like half of the season like that was the back end of your season the players hated it they quit defensively they you know the tackling went to bleep and of course they got you know destroyed in the you know first round of the playoffs and they were frankly lucky to make the playoffs because they had started so well from a record perspective. And I remember you and I talking about it being like, you know, the record's looking good, but like, I don't think this is sustainable. And then, and Jalen hurts gets injured along the way and his effectiveness plummets. Right. And so you go, what was the reason that the Eagles were bad last year or sort of relatively bad relative to expectation is like, okay, well they had bad coordinators and they were, and Jalen hurts got injured and their talent defensively took a dip, especially in the secondary. Well, 
you know, when it comes to the NFL and teams making moves, I want you to at least acknowledge that you're doing it wrong. And the Dallas Cowboys refuse to acknowledge that they're doing it wrong with Mike McCarthy out there. And the guys that they hire, Mike Zimmer as the defensive coordinator and a Schottenheimer and the offensive coordinator. And you're just like, you guys don't get this at all. Whereas Philadelphia is like, Offensive coordinator, you're gone. Defensive coordinator, you're gone. Guess what? We're hiring real people here. We're hiring Kellen Moore, speaking of a guy who probably should have been the head coach of the Cowboys, or at least, you know, better option than Mike McCarthy, who comes over from the Chargers. Like, this is a guy who's been viable for a very long time. And then defensively, Vic Fangio, who, like, yeah, you know, not a head coach material and, like, getting on in age, but, like, an improvement on Matt Patricia, guys. An improvement on Matt Patricia. They also look at their secondary and they go, you know what, James Bradbury, you're washed as a cornerback. If you want to come back, you're moving to safety. By the way, we're also drafting safeties. We're drafting cornerbacks. We're going to load this defensive back room with so many options here. We can't fail, right? I mean, it's obviously it's possible to fail, but it's just like that we're going to have so many options, you're not going to believe it. So they do all of that. And of course, there's, you know, the young guys on the defensive line, the Jordan Davises, the Jalen Carters, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So they're, they're, they're transitioning from the older group um, that they used to have, you know, back when they beat the Patriots, right, in the Super Bowl. So they're constantly going, they have probably the best general manager in the league, and he knows what's wrong. And sometimes during the season, you can't do anything to change it. Right. You can only do stuff or, you know, by and large in the off season. And so they're doing that. And so I look at this and I go, OK, to me, you look at the division, largely a two horse race. I will say that for the right price, like the Broncos in the AFC West, the commanders are a team, new vibe, new ownership, new coach, new quarterback, like very sort of RG3 potential out of, out of uh, Jane McDaniels. Um at, a, at the right price, I'm saying like 13 to 1. And by the way, like you can price shop Philadelphia here as low as minus 125 over okay. at DraftKings. Again, third time in these two episodes that I've mentioned DraftKings. Just maybe happen you know to have really good prices. Maybe you know they're going to be a sponsor I don't know. coming up or something. I mean, that would be sick. DraftKings, you know, holla at, at, uh, at our guy Shell here. So, um, but no, like, you know, just it, it is, one, you know, one of the most popular books. And so you can see like, yeah, there, it is available to people at, at minus 125. I think you can put together a bet that it, that is essentially no that Dallas wins the AFC East, right? Because okay. I don't, I'm not worried about the Giants. It's a no Giants, no Dallas, but I think no Giants was sort of implied there. I think Daniel <laughs> Jones is terrible. I think everybody on the Giants is basically terrible. And I think Washington has a much higher upside. And that might change for the Giants next season when they get rid of Dable and they get rid of Jones and they have similarly exciting kind of pieces uh, in replacing them. Mm -hmm. But there's a possibility because the commanders have kind of played with the Eagles pretty well these last few years. If you look at their individual games against, and so it's not out of the question that they split with the Eagles and then use a better schedule to kind of have a really, really nice season, that kind of miracle type season that teams need to kind of come from way down. But essentially you can put those two together, Philadelphia minus 125 and the commanders at 13 to one. You can put those two together and create essentially a like minus 170 bet on the Cowboys to not win the division. Now you can see right now that them winning the division is plus 170, which means minus 170 is the fair price on the no and a price that you often get, or when, if you look at different sports books and they offer a no option on the, to win the division, that would be priced at close to minus 200, minus 210, minus 220, right? So minus 170 is a good bet. You just have to create it synthetically. So I explain that over at the Substack. If you want to check that out, you can do that there. But the point is here is when it comes to Eagles or Cowboys, as somebody who was on the Cowboys last year, because I didn't like what was going on with the Eagles, I am way on the Eagles instead of the Cowboys this time around. Because, I mean, again, bringing back Zeke Elliott to be your primary running back, <laughs> or, or it's, it's just like, you don't get it. You yeah. don't know what you're doing wrong. And if you don't know what you're doing wrong, how can you correct it? I like the Eagles. I think they know what they're doing wrong. And I think they can correct it. All right. All right. A very interesting division there. And a very interesting division last year as well was the NFC South. An interesting division doesn't necessarily mean good. It just means, yeah. huh? 
<laughs> like yeah. a lot's but going good on for and, us because of value exactly. in, right like in the last two years we'd be like all these teams stink so might as well take a long shot and that's how we landed on the bucks last year exactly so as we break down this year's nfc south race you got the atlanta falcons at minus 130 which just sounds funny to me because i can't picture anyone in this division being favored minus 130 but we'll get into that yeah you got the bucks aforementioned at plus 300 uh new orleans at plus 400 and carolina at plus 1100 uh in this division here Atlanta being heavy favorites, as mentioned, that just makes me laugh. This division is a mess, but it provides value. I I, I look at this and I feel like the Bucks are on a plane where they, not to say that they got lucky last year, but they got some bounces last year that oh, went yeah. in their favor. Oh, and, yeah. And hey, they took advantage of it. And yep. maybe, maybe that has me looking towards New Orleans. I can't lie to you. The problem is I can't really buy Derek Carr. <laughs> right. That's why I can't believe that you even think right? of that, <laughs> knowing how you feel about Derek Carr and it's well deserved. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm a man. If I'm not, if I'm nothing, I'm honest, right? At least mm-hmm. I'll always be honest mm-hmm. with you. Uh what mm-hmm. what do you think about this division, man? Because there's a lot here yeah. that is super interesting to me. Yeah, and it's a little bit lame, uh, you know, somewhat like the Eagles scenario here, but we talked about with regards to the AFC South, where it's mm-hmm. like, okay, if there's a short price, I have to hate the three other teams if I want the short price, right? Yeah. And I think we're there with Tampa <laughs> Bay, with New Orleans, and with Carolina, <laughs> right? Like, the reason we liked Tampa Bay last year yeah. was because Baker Mayfield was being priced at, like, I forget what it was, like, five to one, six to one, something like that, surrounded by a team of veteran players that probably had a year left. And the comparison teams were Derek Carr, rookie Bryce Young, who are, you know, more than a little worried about, and Desmond Ritter as the starting quarterbacks. And so you go like, yeah, Baker Mayfield at that price, mm-hmm. that becomes interesting. Okay. This year, it's Baker Mayfield at a shorter price with Derek Carr and Bryce Young and... Kirk Cousins, a viable quarterback, and by the way, no more Arthur Smith, no more like a, a completely new regime with regards to the Falcons, and a pretty proven regime when it comes to Raheem Morris in his work that he did with the Rams, and he's bringing over Zach Robinson, who is an offensive assistant there as well, right? So you're bringing over a, a, a group where it's like when you brought over Arthur Smith, it was like, what like you just kind of hide the ball to derrick henry for a couple years in tennessee and got this job right like they had to do stuff over in in la and have had to do stuff for longer over in la so normally when you look at the falcons or at least for the last like five years basically since they made that super bowl years and years and years ago right you had matt ryan finishing his career out i think his like I think he was at like 38% win win percentage uh, in his last like four years. So like you were sitting there betting on the Falcons because of Matt Ryan and just constantly losing. Right. And you were betting on a team that was getting credit for being an above average team and they were having way below uh, average results. And then the next year it's Marcus Mariota and Arthur Smith. And like, maybe this is going to work. And then last year it's like, well, Bijan Robinson, like that, you know, that should take some pressure off. It's like, then they just like never use Bijan Robinson. And it's just like, this, this is a ridiculous team. This is a ridiculous group of coaches, et cetera, et cetera. Now I can't, I don't want to paint them the new regime with the same brush as the old regime. And even if Kirk Cousins like doesn't play, I still kind of think Michael Penix is maybe the best quarterback in the division if if Cousins, you know, for some reasons isn't able to go, right? Because the, the Achilles injury. I'm, I'm um, not going to argue off. for Derek Carr there. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and again, like the Saints, right? Like they're clinging to this idea that like the division is so bad and we might be able to win it if we don't like turn a full <laughs> rebuild. But like yeah. Dennis Allen and Derek Carr are like, they just it just is not it. Right. And so like they're going to have six wins. Carolina is going to have five wins and Tampa Bay is probably going to have seven wins. And like that might be good enough to win the division. I mean, Tampa Bay's won it two years in a row and their total record is 17 and 17. 
in the last two years. So, like, what are we hanging on to with regards to the Buccaneers, right? Uh, and so you go, like, okay, I'm out on that. And then, yeah, so the Falcons, they know what they needed. They needed some more defensive help. They went and they made the trade for Matthew Judon, which I think is a pretty astute deal. And then they picked up Justin Simmons, who is available. And you might be like, well, he was available. Like, he can't be that good. But Justin Simmons doesn't play a premium position. He plays safety, and he plays it pretty well and was probably yeah. asking for a long time for a pretty big contract, but like teams aren't going to pay for a safety. And so when the music stopped and all the chairs were filled, Justin Simmons had nowhere to go, but Atlanta was like, you know what? We'll take you on for a pretty good discount here. I believe it was a one year deal. Maybe there's an option in the, in the mix there, but you're adding like two, you know, sort of pro bowl ish level guys, or at least guys who have pro bowl experience in Judon and Justin Simmons. And so like, to me, it's like recognizing what you need and going out and getting it right. And so you can kind of trash them and make fun of them for, drafting Michael Penix where they did when they did but if Kirk Cousins doesn't come back and it and it or, or comes back and gets hurt you know relatively early on in the season with the rest of this roster kind of coming into form here they're going to be really pumped that they have Michael Penix just sitting back there especially if they think he's as good uh, or or if he just is as good as they think he might be based on the idea that like he played one preseason game and they're like okay good like saw what we needed to see like throw him on bubble wrap along with cousins. And let's just go into this season with these two viable quarterbacks. And in the NFL, man, like it really helps to have two viable quarterbacks. It definitely does. And I mean, this division is going to be as mentioned, interesting, but I, I do want to see how Kirk cousins does in an, in yet another new home. And if he can translate his, you know, Kirk cousins, I don't know what to call him like solid QB play. Cause he's not, yeah. terrible do you know what i mean he's no. not terrible yeah and it'll give you flashes of like being pretty good and so if yeah. you can build the infrastructure around him it should be enough to win this division yeah. so i see where you're coming from totally get it <laughs> Kirk cousins um, got a lot better when justin jefferson showed up in minnesota right and he's got drake london Bijan robinson and hopefully the real version of kyle pitts that we've all kind of been hoping for and yeah the infrastructure's there i think yeah, should be interesting for sure. Um, we move on to the NFC North, which <laughs> might be one of the most interesting divisions in football as, you know, perennially being somewhat losers or the perception of losers the last few years. I mean, you got a resurgent Detroit Lions who obviously made the playoffs, made a little run there last year. Green Bay, they definitely put in work last year as well. And, yep. and, and. Caleb Damn. Williams era in Chicago is here yeah. and the hype train is moving in full force. So as we look at the odds to win the NFC North, Detroit leading the way at plus 130, Green Bay at plus 200, the Bears at plus 300, and Minnesota at plus 900. This one is super interesting to me. I don't really know which way to lean if we're talking. Like, even if you're just asking me who's going to straight up win before we get to the value side of it, I think yeah. that's a difficult enough question. But yeah. the, the value of it, I mean, that's a tough one as well because Chicago, it'd be fun to just cheer on the Bears. But I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, I do also want to see it first because we've – not to this level, we've been told, oh, maybe this is a year the Bears will be pretty good. But we've been told this yeah. before. Do you know what I mean? I might sure. want to see it for half yeah. a season or something. <laughs> totally. I like all the teams in this division, not necessarily relative to the market. We'll talk about the like, Bears first here. I like the Bears conceptually. I just don't like what the prices that we're having to pay to back the Bears to do things, right? Like the win total is a little high. The odds are a little low when it comes to winning the division when you've got these sort of the way I look at it, right? Like Detroit's the ready-made team. Green Bay is the team like one step behind them. And like, after, we're going to need one more year to call them ready-made, right? The defense has to get better. They got rid of the defensive coordinator, Joe Barry. That should be improved with uh, Jeff Halfley, who is the head coach at Boston College for a long time. So if the coordination on the defense gets improved by Green Bay, they can step forward, but that step forward still is where the Lions got to last year. Meanwhile, Minnesota is sitting there at plus 900, and I can't bet that because, again, I need that more in the Broncos' territory for pricing to get on Minnesota. But, like, I like Minnesota relative to the idea that people are going to be selling on Sam Darnold being the quarterback. But I have a lot of respect for Kevin O'Connell to be able to make that work because he's had to deal with a bunch. You, you mentioned your boy Josh Dobbs. Like, he's had to deal with a bunch of, frankly, bad quarterbacks and kind of turning them into sort of functionality to at least be competitive 
with, you know, by the way, a lot of talent around, uh, around uh, Darnold. And so I like them relative to market, just not this market. Um, and sometimes I think, okay, like you look at a short price like the Falcons and we go, okay, you have to hate all the other teams to like it. Sometimes the team is really good, like in, you know, I mean, the 49ers relatively recently, though, I mean, their, the teams in their division haven't been all that great in the last few years. I mean, obviously the Rams were. But like with, if the Packers are, are people are excited about the Packers, people are excited about the Bears, and maybe even the Vikings are, you know, sort of a shorter price than I would necessarily expect in this division. That means that they're taking the win probability pie and they're taking piece, bigger pieces of it than maybe they should for how good Detroit is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So like normally if Detroit was in like the AFC West, right, they would be like minus 200 because you'd be looking at all these other teams that are kind of crappy. In this case, you're like, you could make a case for these other teams. But what that does, I think, is actually make Detroit the valuable play at 130 because they should probably be minus 130, right? Because they are the best team in this in this thing. And the, and the schedule, you know, we talk about first place schedules, second place schedules. Like all that Detroit should care about is whether Jared Goff has to play indoors or outdoors. And they play three games outdoors all season long. Hmm. So I kind of don't even care who the opponents are. But when you go through the schedule and you're like, oh, road game, dome. Road game, dome, road game, dome. And you're just like, oh my God, they're getting away with this. Like, just this is what a great deal for Detroit. And yeah, there's some question marks about the defense and the secondary, but they've made, they've, you know, gone through the draft and trying to find guys to, uh, to improve the secondary. And the front seven, I think, is pretty good. Certainly the defensive line is really good. I think the offense is always going to be good. They're going to be able to run the ball. The offensive line is, you know, all, just about all those guys are back from last year. You know, could have better receivers, but again, like if the ball is in the air and they're, and they're open, like most NFL wide receivers are going to catch it. So are, is Detroit perfect? No, not necessarily, but I like the way they play. I like the aggressiveness. I like, you know, it didn't work out for them against the 49ers, but you know, 49ers are on the ropes in that game, in that NFC championship and look for all the world like Detroit was going to make the Super Bowl. And if we think that San Francisco has all that they can kind of, you know, all that they want out of that NFC West and particularly Seattle, and maybe they go under that 11 and a half. Then we look at Detroit and all that cozy indoor football that they're going to be playing at 14 games this year. It's hard for me to make a case that Detroit isn't going to kind of like not cruise necessarily, but win this division handily and maybe take the first seed in the NFC. And now all of a sudden you're looking at all any of one of these teams and potentially having to go to Detroit. So yeah. I think Philadelphia is going to have something to say about that as well. But I think, yeah, Detroit and Philadelphia are kind of the class of this uh, conference, obviously San Francisco as well, but there's far more question marks over in San Francisco than there is with Detroit. So I just look at Green Bay and, I sh and Chicago and I think Chicago, you're taking like 10, five, let's say 5% more of the win probability pie than you probably should. And maybe Green Bay is as well. And then all of a sudden, Detroit, instead of being 60% to win this division, people think that they're like 40, you know, 6% to win the division. And to me, that's too low because I think this team is ready-made and, and this has the schedule that's going to be comfortable for them um, to win the division. So how does that, what you just mentioned about Detroit, fit into your narrative yeah. about the conference in general as we look towards the yeah. conference and sort of think, okay, well – you know, Green Bay might be giving you some good odds to win the, the conference, but of course, talked about the Niners. There might be some long shots there, depending on how much you also like Seattle, right? But mm -hmm. just in terms of the NFC, we know the Niners were the, the heavy favorites throughout the whole season, but you saw them struggle last year, right? And struggle yeah. to these two teams last year, if we're being honest, yeah. in the playoffs. So mm -hmm. what do you what do you make of the NFC value bets? Yeah, so I, I think we can put together a bet here with Detroit and Philadelphia both to win the NFC and kind of go to war with those two teams, right? So if you shop around, I think you can get plus 600 on either side, right? So if you have plus 600, six to one odds on each one using a different sports book, um, you can create, you make two bets, right? One unit on one, one unit on the other. And so now you've got two units for essentially what will pay out plus 300 relative to those. Or you can, you know, you can do a half unit on either side, you know, whatever you want to do. But the point is, is then you're now sitting there with essentially plus three, a plus 300 bet on those two teams to win the NFC, which are better odds than the 49ers have at plus 250 
to win the NFC, right? So if I said to you, like, would you rather 49ers plus 250 or both Eagles and Lions at plus 300, I think you probably take that second choice, right? That leaves still obviously the Cowboys and Packers and Falcons sort of lingering in that next tier. But we've already said that we're down on the Cowboys. And if we think the Lions are going to beat the Packers with regards to the division, we're going to give them sort of the, the you know, nod ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, listen, for the Falcons, like it's one thing saying, okay, I'm pretty confident they're going to win the, the division. Could they just be awesome and then just run amok and then just put up some sort of artificial like 14 and three record this season? I mean, they could. That's a, there's a case for that. I think that's kind of a big leap when you do have sort of a, uh, a, a new staff and obviously a lot of new pieces there together. And, you know, and then after that, you know, Seahawks, at, they're available as, as a long 33 to 1. If you like the idea that the, the Seahawks aren't just going to kind of step in ahead of the 49ers, but are capable of dealing with the NFC, the problem is, right, it's one thing dealing with, okay, regular season, the schedule, yada, yada, yada. It's a different deal of going, okay, can Seattle go on the road and beat Philadelphia if Philadelphia is a one or a two seed? Can they go to Detroit and beat Detroit if they're a one and a two, one or a two seed? At 33 to one, like, yeah, I might be looking to try that, you know, but like anything kind of shorter than that, based on all the things that they need to do, I just, I'm, I'm more comfortable kind of, you know, taking the approach of going Lions and Eagles, you know, plus 600 each, going to war with that bet versus, uh, you know, taking the short shot with the 49ers or, or trying some crazy long shot uh, with even a team that I like a little bit this season. No, I got you. I got you. And I know, as you mentioned before, you got the sub stack up and running, and I know there's going to be a bunch of different features and things up there. Anything you can sprinkle to us here in terms of dealing with the NFC, maybe some awards, maybe some other props or stuff like that involving the NFC? Yeah. So let's focus on the Eagles. Let's focus on the offense and the idea that Jalen Hurts is going to be healthy. Now, listen, he's been banged up in both these seasons there is no guarantee that he is healthy but one player that i that we were sort of afraid of last year because we had the market cornered in the receiving yards because we had cd lamb and we had um uh hill tyreek hill and we were sitting there but halfway through the season we're like man aj brown is putting up numbers it was like 130 yard 130 yard 130 yard you're like dude could you just relax and we got lucky in a way, along with the Cowboys futures that we had, when Hertz got hurt, because Brown's numbers went down because Hertz was just, you know, he was less effective, right? And uh, Brown had two games, one of eight yard game and one nine yard game. Not nine, not nine T, like nine yards and not 88 eight yards right that's two games of 17 yards otherwise he might have been a problem and he actually only had 100 yard game after Jalen Hurts got hurt in that uh, game against Dallas in Philadelphia about midway through the season so I'm looking at AJ Brown as like to win offensive player of the year to like lead the league in receiving like he gotta be that dude right like nobody's accidentally you can accidentally score a bunch of touchdowns in a season as weird as that is to say but like to to lead the league in yardage and to win an award like you got to be a physical freak in a league of physical freaks aj brown qualifies right he is in that same realm of like your justin jeffersons and your cd lambs who are just that good i think this is a big year with kellen moore they're going to run a better pace like a faster pace they're probably going to i mean they're going to Listen, they're going to open it up a little bit more, right? Kellen Moore likes to throw the football. And so I think Hurts to, to A.J. Brown is going to be a problem. A.J. Brown is one of the best receivers on the deep ball. He's one of the best receivers on catching a slant and just shedding tacklers and blowing by guys. He is, again, one of the top five sort of physical freaks in the, in the receiver position. So let's go through it really quickly. Offensive player of the year, 22 to 1. Ooh. Receiving yards, 12 to 1. Uh, you don't want to be left out if he's scoring a bunch of touchdowns and maybe he gets like, you know, uh, clipped. So you, know, you maybe get in, involved in his uh, from a t- uh, touchdown perspective. Um, also with the Eagles, um, Saquon Barkley, I think, is going to have a big season with regards to touchdowns. Because, again, if we're going to try to keep Hurts healthy, stop running him so much, especially in tight spaces like the red zone, like let the ball to Saquon, who, by the way, like one of the best running backs in the last 10 years. And yeah. maybe he's not the same that he was years ago as far as like being able to pop like 80 yard runs. 
But like when we get down to the red zone, like two or three years ago, they were running Boston Scott. <laughs> that was their goal line option, right? <laughs> and even last year, I think the reason they brought in Saquon Barkley, and this is a team that you know often refuses to pay for like linebackers and running backs, right? They brought in Saquon Barkley because I think they looked and they were like, we can't have Jalen Hurts like leading the league in rushing touchdowns. Like, that doesn't do us any good. We need him handing t- the ball to a guy who can sort of pull this stuff off, right? And if you think like, okay, well, what's the standard? Last year it was insane. Mostert had like 18 touchdowns or whatever it was. Like, I don't think he's going to have that number. I think 15 or 16 touchdowns can win this. The Eagles have a ton of rushing touchdowns available to them this year, I think, with less touchdowns coming from Jalen Hurts. So I think Saquon Barkley there, 16 to 1 or better for rushing touchdowns. So big offensive season for the Eagles. Um, Even like most points for might be an option there as well. Uh, Like you said, all that stuff, we're going to get deeper, way, way deeper into it in the next week or so over at the Substack. Super interesting stuff there. And I can't believe that we are here in terms of the NFL season getting ready to kick off. And, you know, next week we will be back doing our regular uh, week one NFL picks. I can't believe like, again, I'm excited for that just because, you know, if you know me and riding the wave of the season, it's, it's an adventure. It's an adventure. And as we're getting closer, I'm starting to get even more and more hype getting ready for that. But, but the preparation doesn't stop here. Not only do we have you on this pod giving some information and education, but there's also the sub stack. So please break down for the people what you're up to now, and where they can find most of your written content now. Yeah, man, it's, it's essentially an experiment for the next year where it's can someone who worked for a large company in the way that I did um, at the score, can, can I make it work independently? And, you know, you build an audience and people sort of understand, like, you know, whether you know what you're talking about, whether you're good at this and you can go and you can work at a company and they'll pay you money and then you can be awesome. They're not going to pay you any more money. Right. They're not going to just, oh, we've got a bunch of money lying around. So this for one year is a free sub stack. Just subscribe to it, you know, test it out for the entire season. When I say season, I mean college football, NFL, NHL, uh, March Madness, like all that stuff. Maybe a little NBA, all that kind of stuff. Um, Test it out for one year, at which point it is going to go to a paid subscription model. And you can bounce at that point. Or, you know, you can ride it along with us. But you're essentially getting free content here, streamlined, no ads, no, you know, um, internal ads, no go to this sports book, go to that sports book. The only only thing we tell you to do about a sports book is I'll point out to you where the best price is for some of these futures that we're going to talk about. Substack.com, you can type in the window, substack.com slash authentic. You can go to the Twitter handle at Emrus Authentic. It's in the bio. It's in the pin tweet. It's in the description of this podcast. It is impossible to miss. And of course, thanks to Matt, as always, for joining us here on the Clutch Pick Sports Betting Podcast. That was episode two of our NFL preview, breaking down the NFC. If you missed part one, just know all you got to do, scroll up or scroll down or just hit refresh and you'll find part one where we break down the AFC. That is all ahead of next week's week one NFL betting preview where we will break down each and every game each and every week. We got you covered. Clutch Picks Sports Betting Podcast. Know where you can find us on YouTube and on Apple and Spotify. All you got to do is search clutch picks sports betting podcast that's how we got you covered special thanks to the people at clutch points for bringing us back for another season of nfl picks hopefully you're along for the ride with us as my name is shell alexander you can find me on twitter at shell alexander and on instagram at sheldon alexander and as i always say i used to pray for times like this to rhyme like this this is a clutch pick sports betting podcast as always unpolished and unapologetic until next time see ya